we've been studying for about been in about a six or eight week study on presumptuous sin. I want you to turn in your Bibles to the 19th Psalm. I'm going to talk about presumptuous sin one more time. And presumptuous sin, the word presumption is the word Z-U-W-D. Z-U-W-D in the Hebrew. And it means to speak or to do proudly, to lift yourself up or to insert your opinion when it comes to the Word of God. Now, if you'll notice what David is saying here in the 19th Psalm, he is talking about how pure God's Word is. Now, when we talk about the word holy, when we talk about the word holy, the word holy in the Greek is the word H-A-G-I-O-S. And the word hallowed, when we say, Lord, hallowed be thy name, it's the word H-A-G-I-A-Z-O. And it means to make holy or to make clean or to make pure. In other words, keep your opinion out of it. When you get involved in presumptuous sin, when you get involved in presumptuous sin, what you're involved in is reinterpreting the Word of God, and you have a tendency to say, and so do I if I get involved in it, which I've been in it. And when David committed a murder and adultery, he involved himself in rearranging the Word of God, and he was simply saying, I can get by with this sin. So he committed murder and adultery. He, he took Bathsheba. He tried to get Uriah the Hittite. He called him out off of the battlefield and said, Go home and sleep with your wife. That way I won't get blamed for my sin. You always get caught in presumptuous sin because your sin is an opinion. And when you involve yourself in presumption, you just simply in your pride, you say, I think... And when a man says, I think, that means he's not taking the word of God. Let's read in Psalms 19 and verse 8. The statutes, that's God's word, that's his commandments, that's his precept, that's everything that he said. The statutes of the Lord are right. The word righteous comes from the word right. And the word righteous is very closely related to that word holy, which is the word hagios. And when God makes his name holy in our life, that's his law. His name, the word name is the word onoma in the Greek. It's the word shem in the Hebrew, and it means authority. His law, his word is right, and he's going to make it holy in our life as he takes us through fire trials as we've been preaching on Sunday morning. Not only is it right, it rejoices the heart. It's the only thing that will make you happy in the Lord. The commandment of the Lord is pure. Keep your opinions out of it. Let's read his word, and even if we don't like it, let's accept it. Enlightening the eyes, it's the only thing that will make you see clearly. The fear of the Lord is clean. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. Enduring forever, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey in the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned. You are warned. You better do what God says or you are in trouble with God. And so am I. And in keeping of them, there is great reward. And it's spiritual. It's not money and things and stuff and houses and lands. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. And if there's anyone that knew about presumptuous sin, it was David. Not only did he know about his own presumptuous sin, the entire first part of his life, he was being sought. And King Saul tried to chase him all over Israel and into the land of the Philistines trying to kill him. And he saw the presumptuous sin of King Saul. Keep back thy servants also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Don't let my opinion rule me. That's what he's saying. God's law is right. It's pure. It'll rejoice your heart. Then shall I be upright. Remember the word upright? It's a word in the Hebrew that corresponds to the, to the word sta'o or histamine, which means to stand upright. It was one who crucified all their opinions, and they were said to bear their cross daily. For 200 years prior to when Christ was crucified, 
What we call Lebanon or the ancient Phoenicians used the cross to kill people by the thousands when uh, some 60 years before Jesus came during the great rebellion of Spartacus, about 6,000 were lined up along the roads and they were killed all at once. So the cross was considered the daily method of bearing your cares in life. And only, you will only be upright bearing your cross, dying to self, dying to your own opinions when you follow the word of the Lord and the Lord keeps you back from presumptuous sin. And he says, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth let me say your word, Lord, and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. And what is acceptable? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Die to self. Die to your opinions. Don't say, let me rearrange the word of God. That's what David did when he committed a murder and adultery. And that's what Saul did. Let me tell you, the penalty for, for presumptuous sin is high to the believer. It was real high to Saul. And you remember David? All the days of David's life, what was it Nathan told him? He said, David, the sword will never leave your house. And he had to confront Joab, his commander-in-chief of his armies. This man was rebellious. He was a murderer. And he was the one that David employed to kill Uriah the Hittite. And the man gave him problems the longest day that he lived because of his presumptuous sin. Payments high, do you remember Achan? God killed all of his household because he took a wedge of gold a goodly Babylonish garment when the Lord said, don't take anything from the enemy. You remember the man who gathered sticks on the Sabbath? God killed him and his family. And when you get involved in presumptuous sin, watch out lest you get your friends in trouble. You remember when Aaron made the golden calf? You know why men get involved in presumptuous sin? They want to be accepted by their peers. I hate that word. <laughs> There's always a word that I hate, and that's one of them. I said something I hated this morning. I forgot what it was. You remember when Aaron, he said, well, but Moses, uh, Moses came down off the mount after 40 days, and, and the people said, Moses is never coming back. Let's make us a golden calf. And they went to Aaron, and they took all their gold to him, and they said, Aaron, make us a calf. So Aaron did that when Moses came down out of the mount. Moses said, what have you done, Aaron? And Aaron said, I didn't do anything. I just threw some gold in the fire and out pops this calf. What did I do? 3,000 people died that day because of Moses' sin, or because of Aaron's sin, of his presumptuous sin. Remember when Corey, when, remember when Corey questioned the leadership of Moses? And God called him out that next day, and Moses said, he said, now, if you die of old age, Corey, I'm not God's prophet. Oh, man, how would you like for Moses to say that to you? <laughs> if you die, he said, if you die of old age, Corey, and all this rebellious company with you, they didn't die of old age. That day the ground opened up, and because of their presumptuous sin to question the prophet of God, the ground opened up. 250 died that day. The people rebelled against Moses and said, why did you kill all these innocent people? 14,700 people died the next day. Boy, the cost of presumptuous sin is high, isn't it? You, do you remember when Aaron and Miriam questioned Moses because they said, well, he married an Ethiopian woman. She's a black woman. And does God just love Moses? Why doesn't he talk to us? You think you want to be the prophet of God and go up there and fast for 40 days and 40 nights? If you think you want to be Jim Brown and preach and be the preacher, I invite any of you over every night if you'd like to come and just sit and watch me study for five or six hours every night because I put that kind of time in. See, some people want to be jealous of the preacher because he has the position, but they don't want to put the work in. God struck Miriam with leprosy and she could have died and Moses implored the Lord and I don't know why he didn't strike Aaron down. I guess because he was the high priest. Aaron gave him enough trouble. And Eve rebelled against the light. What happened? The whole human race was plunged into sin. And one of the truly amazing presumptions of the Old Testament is the rebellion of Israel in worshiping the idols of Ashtaroth and Baal and the golden calf. And God did what he said he would do. He scattered them all over the face of the earth for 2,600 years until May 14, 1948. They haven't had a nation since 586 B.C. when they were carried off at the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. And millions of them died. Not six million. Who was this one? 
the Jews. Who is this that you were talking about? Just the Jews themselves? No, now the Jews, the Jews yes. died for 2,600 years because they kept turning away to idols and they kept turning to... They turned to the sun god and the moon goddess, and they turned to the Ashtaroth and to Baal. And God kept warning them, and he kept saying, I'm going to send sword, famine, pestilence, and the noisome beast. And the beast was the world ruling system. It was Babylon. It was uh, the Persians. It was the Grecians. It was the uh, Romans. And they put them into captivity, and they slaughtered them by the hundreds of millions over 2,600 years. Yes, they were scattered, and yes, Presumptuous sin is a high cost. Righteous men sin in the light, and Paul warns us that we must die to these presumptuous desires. Paul is speaking to the believers in Colossians 3 and 5, and he says, mortify the members of your flesh. You know what the word mortify means? It means all of your desires, kill it off. It means let rigor mortis set in as far as the flesh is concerned. Your, fle your spiritual fleshly, your fleshly desires, get rid of it. You know what all this is? If you, do you think God is going to let us get by with presumptuous sin when he says his word is pure? If this book is pure and we don't live by it, and as believers we know we're supposed to read it and live by it, he's going to bring the judgment he says he'll bring, and everyone in here knows right and wrong, don't you? And we wonder why we get into trouble with God, and we wonder why he brings great devastation to our lives. We've been talking about that through the Sunday morning, how that God is... He has predetermined a fiery trial for his people to be in, to burn out their unholiness and cause us to be holy. God is not going to forget this. Look at Numbers 15. Let me show you something. Numbers, the 15th chapter. Now, God will not at all acquit our presumption. Numbers, the 15th chapter. And look here in the 27th verse. Numbers 15 and verse 27. Now, presumptuous sin is not the sin of ignorance. It's sinning in the light. But let me show you this here. And if any soul sin through ignorance, then he shall bring a she-goat of the first year for a sin offering. And the priest shall make an atonement for the soul that sinneth ignorantly. Now, when you're pre sinning presumptuously, you don't have the kind of sin offering. God will allow us to call upon him and ask forgiveness of sin. But when he sinneth by ignorance before the Lord to make an atonement for him, and it shall be forgiven him. You shall have one law for him that sinneth through ignorance, both for him that is born among the children of Israel and for the stranger that sojourneth among them. But the soul that doth, doeth aught presumptuously, whether he be born in the land or a stranger, the same reproacheth the Lord, and that soul shall be cut off from among his people. And the word cut off is a word that means to hack to pieces, and it means to destroy. We're not going to get by with it those of us especially that know better, because he hath despised the word of the Lord and hath broken his commandment, and that soul shall, be utterly, shall utterly be cut off, and his iniquity shall be upon him. And let's read about this man gathering sticks one more time. Now, this is why the man gathering sticks, God killed him, because he was not sinning in ignorance. He knew the law. He wasn't a heathen. He wasn't a, one of the a land of Moab. He wasn't an Ammonite. He wasn't a Philistine. He wasn't an Egyptian. He wasn't a Phoenician. He wasn't from the land of Syria. He was an Israelite. He knew the law. Don't profane the Sabbath. And he says, well, yes, but God doesn't mean gathering sticks. And then what does he do? Verse 32, and while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day. It's not a matter of gathering sticks upon the Sabbath day. It's a matter that the man knew better. And they found him gathering sticks. And they brought him unto Moses and Aaron and unto the congregation. And they put him on the ward because it was not declared what should be done to him. And the Lord said unto Moses, The man shall be surely put to death. It wasn't the sticks. It was his presumption. He said it really just doesn't matter because it's a small thing. And all the congregation shall stone him with stones without the camp. What was wrong with this man is the same thing that's wrong with some of us. And all the congregation brought him without the camp and stoned him with stones, and he died as the Lord had commanded Moses. What was wrong with this man is the same thing that's wrong with some of us. When we know the truth and we don't live by it and do it, we said this morning, truth is not merely something that we say, oh, well, I believe the Bible the Scripture says truth is something you do. If you don't do truth, 
you deny Christ, and the word deny is the word arnomai in the Greek, and it means to contradict him. This man gathering sticks, you know, was saying, he was saying, God, you don't count. I'll be the judge of this, and I'll do what I want to do. Look over here in Proverbs, the third chapter. Here is what's wrong with people who are presumptuous. Proverbs, the third chapter. Let's look at it. Proverbs 3, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. You can find Psalms. We'll find Proverbs. Proverbs, the third chapter, the seventh verse. Let's read this. 3 and verse 7. Proverbs 3 and verse 7. Be not wise in thine own eyes. When you get so wise, you will not hear the word of God. You say, I believe the Bible, but I don't think God really means it when he tells me to read the word, to study the word, to be faithful in the word, to live in truth, to tell people about Christ, to repent of my sin, to wrestle, to strive entering in at the straight gate to enter in the narrow way, to go through trials and persecution and affliction. Yes, he does mean that. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. What is evil? It's just getting involved in your opinion as opposed to God's word. Now look over here in Proverbs 26, 12. Look at Proverbs 26, 12. Proverbs 26 and verse 12. Seest thou a man wise in his own conceit? There is more hope of a fool than of him. Man who is conceited, is proud. <clears throat> that's all. That's all that's wrong with us when we are involved in our sin. Proverbs twenty, uh, Isaiah five and twenty one. Look at Isaiah five and twenty one. Isaiah five and verse twenty one. Isaiah five and let's read twenty and twenty one. Warn to them that call good evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light. See, when we get involved in our sin in our opinion. What we're doing is we're putting good for evil and evil for good. What the world is calling today, God has already given us some commandments. He's already said over the 21st chapter of the book of Leviticus that if a man wrestled with another man and they bump into a woman and she's carrying a child, she's pregnant, and the baby is accidentally aborted, the man had to give eye for eye, tooth for tooth, limb for limb, burning for burning, stripe for stripe, Life for life. It was against the law to abort babies accidentally back then. You better be careful when you was around a pregnant woman. We already know in the 20th chapter of Leviticus that the scripture teaches us that uh, if a man lie with a man, this is an abomination to God and the both of them shall die. And I'm not trying to point out just homosexuality. If you were children and you were rebellious to your parents, you also died if you were over rebellious and you couldn't be corrected. So, see, we're calling good evil today and evil good. See, if you preach the truth and stand up and tell truth to the world, people say, well, he's a fanatic and he's a nut and he's a preacher and, you know, he needs to be quietened down. We need to give the homosexual their civil rights. Let's make them equal. Well, I'm not saying homosexuality is any worse than other sin, but you cannot legalize. We don't need to say, well, we need to give liars their civil rights. You know, after all, a man that's a liar can't help it. Or a man that is running around on his wife, he is sick, and it, this is a, an illness. No, it's not. It's sin. We've got all these reasons why we don't call sin sin anymore. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And look at verse 21. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. When we do that, we just say, I'll be the judge of this just like Eve did. I'll do what I think is right. I'll justify myself. Look at verse 23. He, or look at verse 22. Woe to them that are mighty to drink wine and men of strength to mingle strong drink, which justify the wicked for reward. And in order to get the sale, we let a man get by with his sin. Glenn, don't we sometimes? We've been known to do that, hadn't we? We let a man get by with a sin, say, if I tell him the truth right now, he won't buy this house from me. He won't buy this car from me. And we justify the wicked for reward. A lot of times preachers will not tell the truth to the congregation because they're afraid some of the wolves out there will leave because they're making the building payment so they make it easy on them and they justify the wicked for reward and they take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. And that's what Saul was doing to David. I'll give you a couple of more of these. Look at... Look at uh, 1 Corinthians 8, 2. 1 Corinthians 8, verse 2. And then we're going to come back and talk about Saul. 1 Corinthians 8, and verse 2. 
And if any man think, oh me, <laughs> is that not our problem, thinking? I think, you know what I think about the Bible? I had a guy tell me one day, you know what I think about that? I said, I really don't care what you think. If you don't know anything about the Bible, please don't tell me what you think. He had no idea where the verses where I was talking about, he sure did have an opinion. If I tell you something, I'm going to show you where it is in the Word of God. He said, if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing as it yet as he ought to know. When I was 28, 29, 30, boy, I could say, I know, I know, I know. I know. I could say that real fast. And the older I get, the less I know. I'm not, at 55, I'm not as smart as I was when I was 30. I wish y'all could have been around back then. Because I was real smart back then. I can really tell you what it's about. And the older I get, I remember Clint Gurry was over here one night, Clint was 70, and he said, Jim, I don't hardly know anything anymore. <laughs> and that's what we need to come to. It's when we begin to realize that God's word is true. And what did Paul say? Every man is a liar. What was he talking about? When you get involved in your opinion, you insert your opinion. Now, look over here in, in 1 Corinthians 10 and 12. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 12. When a man thinketh he standeth, let him take heed, lest he fall. The word standeth is the word H-I-S. T-E-M-I in the Greek. And that word comes from the word S-T-A-O. And the word histame means to be upright. What did David say? What did David say? He said, the word of God will make you upright. This is the New Testament word of that, of that word over there in Psalms 19. This is the New Testament equivalent. And a man who was upright was said to be carrying his cross daily, dying to self, dying to his own opinions, what he is saying is when you think you know. I've said this on Sunday mornings. I've been on this series on baptism. It has been the most overwhelming thing. It's about the staining of the blood of Christ. And I've been on this spiritual communion on Wednesday nights. And I tell Mary, I said, this thing is so overwhelming to me. And I've been studying it for years. It's just, it weighs my head down. And sometimes I'm saying, God, you are magnificent. I can't really grasp everything that you are. If a man thinks he stands, back in the 60s when I was traveling all over America and preaching in churches, I thought I was, I didn't really at the time think I was arrogant. But I'd get to thinking, well, I got this message, and boy, if I really want to impress preachers, I'll preach this, and I think I've got that down. And when I would think that, I would quit learning on that subject. If you ever think you've really learned on all these subjects and these doctrines we're talking about, you haven't. I've studied the Bible for 36 years, and the things that I started studying 36 years ago, some of them are just, they're overwhelming, overwhelming me today. I said to Glenn the other night, I said, some of the subjects that we study, like the doctrines of sovereignty and predestination and the doctrines of the daily cross and the death of self and the election, and, and some of these things just, they overwhelm me today, and I get really excited if I get around somebody that wants to talk about them. I just get, I'm like a little boy that learned it last week, and I started studying it 30-something years ago. The Word of God is, it rejoices my heart. Isn't that what David said? Stay away from your presumptuous sin. God is not going to acquit our wickedness. He will not let us off the hook for our wickedness. And the presumptuous sin, the cost is high. Let's go back over here to 1 Samuel. We've been talking about a man named Saul. He was the first king of Israel. <coughs> this man had one purpose over here in the ninth chapter of Samuel. The people came and they said, not chapter 1 Samuel, the people came and they said, we want a king to rule over us. Samuel, you've got two sons. They're wicked, and they are taking bribes at the gate of the temple, and they're lying with some of the women, and they're offering strange incense to God, and we don't like this. We want a king. And God said, I'm their king, Samuel. They haven't rejected you. They've rejected me from reigning over them. So he sends a young man by the name of Saul. There was not a goodlier man in all Israel than Saul. He was beautiful. He was taller than anybody in Israel, and that's what we always elect. We elect a tall, handsome guy, and that's the way politics works. That's what we always put to the top of some corporation. That's what we always put on the top ladder of the, of the, uh, uh, of the situation. I was talking to Jason about that the other day. We always elect the man who looks the part. He's got premature gray hair. He's six foot four, and he's got a big, round voice. A lot of times, they don't know anything. One time I was 19 years old, 20, somewhere around there, and 
I was going to a church in Fort Worth, and when I was 20, I looked like I was 13, <laughs> and I looked like a little kid, and, and I'd been studying the Bible for a few years, even at 20 years old, and me and this one guy, he was 6'4", and he was black hair, and he was real handsome. And he was about my age, and we were up for the auditorium class, and they wanted one of us to teach the auditorium class, and guess who got it? The guy who didn't know anything that was tall and handsome. And every week he'd come to me and he'd say, Jim, I don't understand this. Could you help me with, the, 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 <laughs> with my studies? And so I'd help him, show him, and here I am looking up to him. That's the way the world is. Don't get upset at that. That's just the way it is. But God does not look at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. Well, the first king of Israel, the Lord says, here's the king you've, whom you've chosen. He had one job at Israel, and he never did it, and he never did it. Not only did he not do it, when he did try to do it, he didn't do it right. He had one purpose, and that's it right there. King Saul's purpose in Israel, he was appointed for one purpose, and that was to save Israel from the Philistines. Let's look here in verse 16 of chapter 9 of 1 Samuel. Well, let's look at verse 15, 16. Now the Lord had told Samuel in his ear a day before Saul came, saying, Tomorrow about this time I will send thee a man out of the land of Benjamin, and thou shalt anoint him to be captain over my people Israel, that he may save my people out of the hands of the Philistines. And that was his job, except he was scared to death of the Philistines. He was tall, and he had a very righteous son, his name was Jonathan, and Jonathan wasn't afraid of anything. He wasn't as big as his father. He loved David. But Saul, oh, he was ready. If He was ready when it came to fight the Ammonites over in the 11th chapter. He was ready to fight the Ammonites because they were a little bitty nation, and they came up against Saul at Jabesh Gilead, and they thought, and Saul said, well, I'll fight the Ammonites. I'm six foot six, and I don't mind fighting fighting some guy that's five foot four. Well, who does? You know. So he's ready to fight the Ammonites, but when it came time to fight the Philistines, Samuel had given him a commandment. He said, Saul, you go to Gilgal. You stay there seven days, and you wait till I get there. And Saul went there, and then he had 2,000 men, and Jonathan, he said, his son, had 1,000 men, and they came up against an army of the Philistines of 30,000 chariots. You couldn't whip 30,000 chariots unless you had God on your side. 6,000 horsemen and footmen that covered the plain, and he had 3,000 men altogether. And Samuel said, go there and wait there seven days, and when I come there, I'll offer sacrifice. Well, that day... Saul looks around and goes, oh, me, oh, me. Well, Samuel, I didn't know you were going to, I didn't know there's this many people. And he didn't wait. He'd run around in a circle, and all the people fled from Saul, and they started hiding in the caves because they saw that their leader was chicken. You see, if the leader will stand and say, look, God's going to be here. You people can scatter. I'm going to stand here. But he didn't. He didn't have the nerve to stand. So the people hid in caves and insults. Maybe it's because I haven't offered sacrifice. He wasn't supposed to offer sacrifice. Samuel said, when I get there, I'll offer the sacrifice. And when Samuel got there, he said, what have you done? Well, I thought maybe I'd offer sacrifice because he said, I told you to wait for me. You just stand there and wait. I'm the voice of God. And Saul presumed that he could do what he wanted. And then, then over in the 15th chapter of 1 Samuel, he didn't do the will of the Lord. The Lord said, go to Amalek. And Saul said, I don't mind fighting the Amalekites. They're not very big. <clears throat> so he goes to Amalek, and he captures King Agag, and brings him back and a bunch of the sheep. And the Lord said, but Saul, I told you. Samuel said, Saul, he said, God told you to utterly destroy everybody, to kill everything, men, women, children, camels, cattle, sheep, everything. What's this bleeding in the sheep? I hear you say, well, I did the will of God. No, he didn't. Samuel said, God's going to take the kingdom from you. You've been a very arrogant man. So he anoints David king over Israel. Over in the 16th chapter, and in the 17th chapter, an evil spirit from the Lord enters Saul. David goes out and fights Goliath. Then he comes back from his, his big crusade, this little, who is fighting the Philistines here? Let me ask you, who is fighting the Philistines in the 17th chapter? Who? David, whose job is it to fight the Philistines? Uh, Saul. That's 
right. He wasn't doing it. You see, he was afraid. He was standing over the side while Goliath walked through the valley and said, send me your champion. I'm the champion here. David said, I'll go. And everybody's going, Saul's saying, we don't know what to do. Saul, that's your job. If you believe God, you can do it. Because, see, God performed the miracles for his people. You remember Jonathan took his armor bearer and they went over and killed 20,000 Philistines. Uh, 20, not 20,000. <laughs> they killed 20 Philistines. Well, not just, just Jonathan, his son, his armor bearer. Just two of them. Two against 20. You see, God had these people and he loved these people. Well, we know the story of Saul. How that he tries to kill David over and over again. How he throws the javelin at him twice. And how he throws the javelin at Jonathan, his son. And how that David has to run for his life throughout the, out the book of 1 Samuel. And we're going to go over here to the 21st chapter of Samuel. David, we saw last week how Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan, Jonathan there in the 20th chapter. And how that uh, Saul cast the javelin at his own son into verse 33. And Jonathan goes to David and he says, David, run for your life. My father's not going to let you live. And David goes to, to the land of Nob. And he goes to Ahimelech in the 21st chapter. And he gets some bread from him. He gets the showbread, some of the older showbread that's taken out of the temple. And he gets the sword. He gets the sword of Goliath. Because he didn't have anything to defend himself with. And he has to feign himself mad there in the 13th verse in order to keep some of the Philistines from killing him. Well, Saul finds out about this thing with David. He finds out where he is, and he wants to know how he can, how he can go out here and kill David. Look here in verse 20, chapter 22, verse 1. David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. And everyone that was in distress and everyone that was in debt and everyone that was discontented gathered themselves unto him and he became a captain over them and there were with him about 400 men. And David's got him an army of 400 men and he's always fighting Saul. Well, Saul is very upset because David escapes him and Saul comes before his people. He starts feeling sorry for himself. Now, Saul is ignoring the commandment of God and in his presumption, he is chasing the anointed king David all over Israel trying to kill him. What is his job? Kill the Philistines. <laughs> He's trying to kill the wrong guy. Presumptuously, he is changing the commandment of the Lord. The price is high for presumption. Look here. So look what Saul does. He starts feeling sorry for himself. I think Saul needs a therapist. <laughs> <laughs> or either that or he needs to listen to the word of God. Look here in verse 6. When Saul, when Saul heard that David was discovered and the men that were with him, now Saul abode in Gibeah under a tree in Ramah, having his spear in his hand, and all his servants were standing about him. Then Saul said unto his servants that stood about him, that stood about him, Hear now, you Benjamites, will the son of Jesse give every one of you fields and vineyards and make you all captains of thousands and captains of hundreds? And he's trying to speak against David and say, I'm the king, you better get away from him. I will give, he will give you the things that I'm going to give you. And he tried to bribe the people. Then all of you have conspired against me. You're all against me. And there is none that showeth me that my son hath made a league with the son of Jesse. I want to know, is Jonathan really trying to help David? None of y'all will come to me and talk to me. Saul was an arrogant, ignorant man. I don't care if he was the tallest, handsomest man in Israel. It didn't mean anything. And there is none of you that is sorry for me. Well, don't feel sorry for me. All I'm trying to do is kill David, the anointed of God. I just want to kill him because he's trying to steal my throne. No, he's not. God has taken you off the throne. He said, Samuel, how long wilt thou mourn off over Saul, seeing I have rejected him? Go down to Jesse's house. I have appointed me a king among his sons. And he found the eighth son of Jesse, the shepherd boy out back. And he said, this is my king. Anoint him. Do you know, even at this point in time, as far as God was concerned, David was king, not Saul. And Saul is running around all over the country in his presumption, ignoring the word of God, ignoring the command of God, kill the Philistines, deliver Israel out of the hand of the most powerful army in the Middle East of that day. They were a formidable force. They were the most powerful army going, and God said, I need a man who listen to me. I don't need a tall, handsome guy with a big, round voice. I don't need that. 
I need a man that believes me. And they say that David was a ruddy complexion. And most of the people believe that, most of your scholars and theologians believe that David was red-headed and had freckles. Who's going to, we don't believe in red-headed freckle-faced guy to be king. We don't believe in that. Give me a tall guy with premature gray hair and a big round voice, pear-shaped tones. There is none of you that is sorry for me or, or showeth unto me that my son has stirred up my servant against me to lie and wait as at this day. And they got all upset at Ahimelech because Ahimelech had fed the anointed of God, David. And Saul said, I want the people to kill Ahimelech and all of the priests of God. This man, you know what he's doing? He's trying to kill David. If he can't kill David, he'll kill the priests of Israel. What's his job? Kill the Philistines. Isn't this unbelievable? Saul's going to pay. And look here, the king said in verse 16, Thou shalt surely die, Himelech, and all thy father's house and the king's. He said, You're going to die because you fed David and you gave him Goliath's sword, something to fight me with. And the king said unto the footman that stood about him, Turn and slay the priests of the Lord because their hand also is with David and because they knew when he fled and did not show it to me. But the servants of the king would not put forth their hand to fall upon the priests of the Lord. Do you remember when the Lord said, do you remember when Saul said, kill Jonathan, my own son, because he ate when I told him not to eat, and he was over killing Philistines? Do you remember that? The people in Israel didn't believe King Saul. They said, we're not killing him. So he employed an evil man. His name was Doeg, and Doeg said, I'll kill him. And the king said to Doeg, Turn thou and fall upon the priest. And Doeg the Edomite turned and fell upon the priest and slew on that day fourscore and five persons that did wear the linen ephod. He killed 85 of the priests of God, and he's supposed to be killing Philistines. <laughs> he is certainly presumptuous, isn't he? And David fled for his life. I want you to notice something here. Look here in verse, look at chapter 23. This is unbelievably amazing chapter 23. What's Saul's job? Kill Philistines, deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Now let's read. Then they told David, saying, Behold, the Philistines fight against Keilah, and they robbed the threshing floor. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and fight these Philistines? Well, I thought that was Saul's job. Well, it is. But David goes and does the work of the Lord. And the Lord said unto David, Go and smite the Philistines and save Keilah. And David's men said unto him, Behold, we be afraid here in Judah. How much more than, than if we come to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? Then David inquired of the Lord yet again, and the Lord answered him and said, Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will deliver the Philistines into your hand, David. And David and his men went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines and brought away their cattle and smote them with a great slaughter. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. And guess what Saul wants to do? He wants to come and kill David, not Philistines. <laughs> and it came to pass when Abiathar, the son of Himelech, fled to David to Keilah, that he came down with an ephod in his hand, and it was told Saul that David was come to Keilah. And Saul said, God hath delivered him into mine hand. I'm going to go kill David. I'm supposed to be killing Philistines, but I'm going to go kill David because he's trying to get my throne. You see, he is presumptuous with the word of God. When you get presumptuous, you're going to pay. And once you get into Bob and presumptuous sin, you get worse and worse and worse and worse. And Saul's whole life was a life of presumption. Why do you think David said, God, deliver thy servant from presumptuous sin. I not only remember my sin uh, with Bathsheba and Uriah the Hittite when I murdered him and I committed adultery with his wife, but boy, do I ever remember Saul. Whew. He says, God hath delivered him into my hand, for he is shut in by entering into the town that hath gates and bars. And Saul called all the people together to war to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. And his job was to go down there and attack the Philistines with David, but he didn't. And David knew that Saul secretly practiced mischief against him and said to Abiathar the priest, Bring hither the ephod. Then said David, O Lord God of Israel, thy servant hath certainly heard that Saul seeketh to come to Keilah to destroy the city for my sake. And he says, God, will the men of Keilah deliver me into his hand? And God says, yes, flee for your life, David. And so David runs for his life, and Jonathan comes to David and finds him in the wood and says, David, I love you. You're my brother in Christ, and I know you, and, and you're, my, you're my king, and I know that you'll reign. And look at verse 17. Jonathan comes to David, Jonathan, the son of Saul, 
And he said unto him, Fear not, for the hand of Saul my father shall find thee, and thou shalt, shalt not find thee, and thou shalt be king over Israel, and I shall be next unto thee, that also Saul my father knoweth. Jonathan was a righteous man. He knew David's heart. He knew his own father's heart. You remember what he said when Saul wouldn't go up against the Philistines back in the 14th chapter? He said, My father's troubling Israel. The penalty is great. So Saul, he inquires of the men of the Ziphites where David is. And, and the Ziphites say, well, they said, well, David has an old haunt there in verse 22. And that means, a, it means a foot or a step. It means David has got some stomping grounds where he likes to run around over here in the hills. And he said, you can go catch him. And God delivers David. Saul encompasses one side of the mountain, David the other. And Saul's army surrounds David. <laughs> And God immediately takes Saul back to his job. Look at verse 26. And Saul went on this side of the mountain, and David and his men on, the side, on that side of the mountain. And David made haste to get away for fear of Saul, for Saul and his men compassed David and his men round about them. But there came a messenger unto Saul, saying, It's time to get back to the job at hand. Haste thee and come, for the Philistines have invaded the land. And while David is trying to kill the anointed of God, the Philistines are... Huh? No, oh, excuse me. Saul's trying to kill the anointed of God, David. While Saul is trying to kill the anointed of God, the Philistines are making havoc with the towns on the borders of the land. I'm telling you, God will not allow this to continue. I want us to read chapter 24. In chapter 24, Saul, David gets a chance to kill Saul. David is a righteous man much more than Saul. Saul is all, all of his presumption. And Saul is always repenting, but David knows better. Look here in verse 1. And it came to pass when Saul was returned from following the Philistines that it was told him, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of Ben Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of Israel and went to seek David and his men upon the rocks of the wild goats. And he came to the sheep coats, by the way. Now, sheep coat, they had hundreds of sheep coats all over Israel. They, they would have a cave in the side of a mountain, and the shepherds would come along, and they would stack up these rocks all around, this, around the caves. And the, and the shepherds, had the, as they were grazing their sheep, they would bring them in there out of a storm, and the sheep coat was a wall of rocks stacked up. The sheep coat was the little wall right outside the cave. And Saul, and it came to... And, Saul came to the sheep coats, by the way, and there was a cave, and Saul went in to cover his feet. To cover the feet meant, to, meant that he went in to lay down and go to sleep. He needed some rest from chasing the anointed of God because he was arrogant and proud and ignorant, and God's going to bring this man down. And Saul went in to cover his feet, and David and his men remained in the sides of the cave. And the men of David said unto him, Behold, the day of which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand, that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. Then David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privily. Privately inside the cave, he one of them just clipped a piece of the robe off. And that hurt David's heart. Saul didn't, didn't care anything about plunging a spear through David, but David, it upset David so much that he did that. And it came to pass afterward that David's heart smote him because he had cut off Saul's skirt. And he said unto his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch forth mine hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. Now, once the Scripture says we're not to touch the Lord's anointed, it doesn't mean we're not to correct false teachers. A lot of people use this verse right here, and this is mentioned three different times in the book of 1 Samuel, and they use this to say, well, you shouldn't correct preachers. Oh, yes, you should. Men like Hymenaeus and Philetus, and we've talked about a lot of the charismatic teachers, how they're teaching health and wealth, and they're teaching the devil's doctrine. The word devil is the word dio, the daemon. It's our word demon. It comes from the root dial, meaning to distribute fortunes. When I call those men down, it's because they're teaching false doctrine. It does not mean, don't touch the Lord's anointed. When it says don't touch the Lord's anointed, don't destroy him, don't kill him. God will take care of his anointed. So David stayed his servants with these words and suffered them not to rise against Saul, but Saul rose up out of the cave and went on his way. And David also rose afterward and went out of the cave and cried after Saul, saying, My Lord, the king! And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed himself. David said to Saul, Wherefore hearest thou men's words, saying, Behold, David seeketh thy hurt, 
He said, what am, why are you seeking me, Saul? Why are you trying to hurt me? Behold, this day thine eyes have seen how that the Lord hath delivered thee today into mine hand in the cave, and some... He said, you've been delivered into my hand. Some of my men wanted me to kill you, but mine eyes spared you. And I said, I will not put forth mine hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Mm. And he was. And Saul repents himself. And he said, and David said, you've hunted my soul. And the Lord judged between me and thee, and the Lord avenged me of thee. And he said... <laughs> He said, Saul, I don't know why you're trying to do this. Look at verse 14. After whom is the king of Israel come? After whom dost thou pursue? After a dead dog, after a flea? I'm just a nothing in Israel. I only got 400 men. You got thousands. You're still the king in the eyes of the people. Why are you trying to do this to me? In verse 16, and it came to pass when David had made an end of speaking these words unto Saul, and Saul said, Is this the voice of my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept, and he started repenting, and he didn't mean a word he was saying. He kept trying to kill David all the way to the end. Look at verse 20. And now behold, I know well that thou shalt surely be king. This is what Saul says to David. And that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in thine hand. And he's lying right through his teeth. Because he's still going to try to kill him. He's still living in his presumptuous sin. Swear now therefore unto me by the Lord that thou wilt not cut off my seed after me and that thou wilt not destroy my name out of my father's house. And David swore unto Saul and Saul went home. But David and his men got them up into the hold and Samuel died. Samuel is dead at this point. I want you to notice that. I'm, we're going to take you over here and I'm going to show you something. Samuel died and then David has his episode with Nabal, how Nabal will not turn to him and God kills Nabal throughout this next chapter through chapter 26, uh, 25, in chapter 26, David has another chance again to kill Saul. Look at verse, Saul lies down in the trench. Verse 7, and David and Abishai came to the people by night, and behold, Saul lay sleeping within the trench, and his spear stuck in the ground at his bolster, and they were after David again. He was chasing David. Every time he turned around, he'd hear where David was. He'd repent. He'd weep. He didn't mean his repentance. He didn't really mean to turn. And he was presumptuous that he was going to get by with all of this. Verse 8, Then said Abishai to David, God hath delivered thine enemy into thine hand this day. Now therefore let me smite him. I pray thee with the spear even to the earth at once, and I will not smite him the second time. And David said to Abishai, Destroy him not, for who can stretch forth his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? You can't get presumptuous before God and ever be guiltless. And David said, furthermore, as the Lord liveth, the Lord shall smite him, or his day shall come to die, and he shall descend into battle and perish. David, the prophet of God, the king of Israel, said he gave his first great prophecy. He had Saul's going to die in battle. God's not going to let him live. He's going to pay for what he's doing. Let me tell you, you and I will pay if we presumptuously try to rearrange the word of God. The Lord forbid that I should stretch forth mine hand against the Lord's anointed one more time. But I pray thee, take thou now the spear that is in his bolster and the cruise of water and let us go. And David took his spear. Look at verse 13. Then David went over to the other side and stood on the top of the hill afar off in a straight, great space being between them. And people say, don't reprimand the false prophet. David stood on the hillside and reprimanded Saul before his men. Before all the armies of Israel, he said, Why are you doing this? David cried to the people and to Abner the son of Ner, and saying, He answers thou, Abner, then answer, Abner answered and said, Who art thou that cries to the king? And David said to Abner, You ought to be ashamed of yourself because you're supposed to be protecting the king. And I had him right in my hand, and I could have killed him. But I won't lay my hand against the Lord's anointed. He said, Abner, you're a righteous man, but are you worthy to die? Abner was the commanding general of Saul's army, and he said, you put him right in my hand. David cared more for the king than his own people. It was because of Saul's presumption. What, what kind of a friend could Saul have had in David if he had embraced him? He would had the best friend he ever had. Here's a man, while he's trying to kill him, 
David saves his life and reprimands the people that are supposed to be looking after him. Saul was blind in all of his pride. <sighs> Saul gets real. David calls him down. Saul weeps again. Look at verse 20. He says, For the king of Israel has come out to seek a flea, as one that doth hunt a partridge in the mountains. David gave himself not much credit. And Saul starts weeping, and oh, I've sinned, and I will no more do thee harm in verse 21. And, and I've played the fool, and I've erred, I've erred exceedingly. And David answered and said, Behold, the king's spirit, let one of the young men come and fetch him. For the Lord delivered thee in my hand today, and I would not stretch forth mine hand against the Lord's anointed. Look at 27, verse 1. David said in his heart, I shall now perish one day by the hand of Saul. <laughs> David knew his heart, didn't he? Look at chapter 28. Payday has come, Saul. You cannot get by with sinning presumptuously against God. And it came to pass in those days, it was time to fight the Philistines, Saul. And for once, Saul starts to try to do the right thing, but he's been presumptuous too long, and God says, too late. God will not allow us to continue in our presumptuous sin, rearranging the Word of God, ignoring His Word. Ignore the Word of God. God will bring devastation on your life. Payment for presumptuous sin is devastating in the believer's life. Continue long in sin, rebelling against the Word of God in the light of truth, and you'll end up with the same destination is Saul. Verse 1, chapter 28, it came to pass in those days that the Philistines gathered their armies together for warfare to fight with Israel. And Achish said unto David, Know thou assuredly that thou shalt go out with me to battle thou and thy men. David was living among the Philistines. David had to flee for his life among the enemy. David said to Achish, Surely thou shalt know what thy servant can do. And Achish said to David, Therefore will I make thee keeper of mine head forever. David is not going to fight for the Philistines. Nope. Samuel was dead. So Saul says, The day's come. I've got to fight today. I can't run any longer. I've got to fight the Philistines. They have this great army. He said, I've got to go inquire of the Lord. He was not repentant. He had not repented of his, of his presumptuous sin. And Saul had made a law against seeking familiar spirits and inquiring of the dead. Anybody who says, oh, we saw the Virgin Mary over here and we saw her. No, you didn't. That's against the law of God. That is not God that's sending anyone who is dead. Now, this Lourdes and the Fatima and all Fatima and all of these visions, that's a lie. God, Mary is, she is, she was a wonderful woman while she's here, but she was not, she's no longer a virgin. First of all, Jesus had brothers and sisters. Now, look here in verse 7. Then said Saul unto his servants, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said unto him, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. He sought the witch at Endor. And Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment. And he went and two men with him. And they came to the woman by the night and said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit and bring me him up whom I shall name unto thee. He wanted to see Samuel because he knew Samuel had something with God. He had strength with the Lord. But Samuel was dead. You can't talk to the dead. And Saul is wanting to break the law of God. He's still presumptuous. And the woman said unto him, Behold, thou knowest what Saul hath done. She didn't recognize him at first. How he hath cut off those that have familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. Wherefore thou layest thou a snare for my life to cause me to die. And Saul sware to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord liveth, there shall no punishment happen to thee for this thing. Then said the woman, Whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, Bring me up Samuel. I want to talk to the dead prophet. That's against God's law in the 18th chapter of Deuteronomy to talk with familiar spirits. He's still breaking God's law. Do you see that? If Saul had come to God in his humility and said, God, forgive me of what I've done to David. Forgive me of my sin. Oh, God, I, I want you to... I repent in sackcloth and ashes. And God would have caused him to overcome. 
in all of his presumption, I don't remember Saul ever doing anything righteous. Verse 12, And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice, and the woman spake to Saul, saying, Why hast thou deceived me? For thou art Saul. You're the one that, that outlawed me. And the king said unto her, Be not afraid, for what sawest thou? And the woman said unto Saul, I saw God's ascending out of the earth. And he said unto her, What form is he of? And she said, An old man cometh up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel, and he stooped with his face to the ground, and he bowed himself, and he was scared. And Samuel said to Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me? Samuel's dead. God allowed this vision of Samuel to come to Saul. You know why? So he could pronounce judgment on him. To bring me up, and Saul answered, I am sore distressed, for the Philistines make war against me. And God has departed from me, and I've tried to pray, and I put on the ephod, he won't hear me. God has departed from me and answers me no more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. He's not repentant. Therefore I have called thee that thou mayest make known unto me what I shall do. Then said Samuel, Wherefore then dost thou ask of me, seeing the Lord has departed from me and has become thine enemy? Contain your presumptuous sin, you make an enemy of God. Remember, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. You remember that? Over there in the book of James, the fourth chapter, the word resisteth is the word A-N-T-I-T-A-S-S-O-M-A-I, -S 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 and that means to wage war with. God resisteth the proud, and the word proud is the word H-U-P-E-R-E-P-H-A-I-N-O-S. This is Saul. That means to shine, phanos, above others. Saul show he shined above God's commandments. God said, I'll make war with you. You're my enemy now. When you sin presumptuously against God, look here. We'll read just a few more verses. We'll stop. Verse 17, Samuel speaking. Samuel long dead, speaking to Saul, says the, says, the Lord hath done to him as he spake by me, for the Lord hath rent the kingdom out of thine hand and given it into thy neighbor, even to David, because thou obeyedest not the voice of the Lord, nor executed his fierce wrath. Upon Amalek, therefore, hath the Lord done this thing unto thee this day. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with thee into the hand of the Philistines. What was Saul's job? He never was doing it right. He just ignored God, and he even tried to talk to the dead at the very end. And God said, I'll send a dead man to you, and it'll be Samuel, and you ain't going to like what he says. And tomorrow shalt thou and thy sons be with me. Tomorrow you're going to die, Saul. You're going to come to me. You're the anointed of God. Let me tell you, Saul was a believer. He said, you're coming to be with me. You and Jonathan, you're going to die. You remember what presumptuous sin costs? It costs innocent men their lives. 3,000 with Aaron, 250 plus 14,700 with Korah. Oh, by the way, if you and I commit, continue in our presumptuous sin, it might cause the, cost the lives of our mother, our father, our children, our wife. God won't just deal with us. He deals with those around us. Tomorrow shalt thou and thy sons be with me. The Lord also shall deliver the host of Israel into the hands of the Philistines. And it scared the life out of Saul. He was scared out of his mind. Saul fell straightway all along on the earth and was sore afraid because of the words of Samuel, and there was no strength in him, for he had eaten no bread all the day nor all the night. And look at verse 31. Payday is here. Chapter 31. It's time to pay, Saul, for your presumptuous sin. Verse 1, chapter 31, the Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines and fell down slain in Mount Gilboa. And Saul never did fulfill his calling. And the Philistines followed hard upon Saul and upon his sons. And the Philistines slew Jonathan and Abinadab and Melchishua, Saul's sons. And the battle went sore against Saul, and the archers hit him. And he was sore wounded of the archers. The judgment of God has come upon Israel because their king wouldn't do the commandment of God. He was always afraid of them. He never had the nerve. He was a bully. He could fight little people, but he didn't have the nerve to stand up against the mighty army of the Philistines. God would have delivered him. Then said Saul unto his armor bearer, Draw thy sword and thrust me through therewith, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer would not, for he was sore afraid. Therefore Saul took a sword and fell upon it, and when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he fell likewise upon his sword and died with him. So Saul died. 
and he paid for his presumptuous sin. And his three sons and his wonderful son Jonathan died because of the presumptuous sin of his father. And his armor bearer and all his men that same day together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for teaching us. <laughs> Let us not live presumptuously. Lord, when we do, not only will we pay, those loved ones about us, Lord, you bring judgment upon them. Lord, your word is pure. Let us keep thy servant from presumptuous sin. Your word is the only thing that will make us upright. It is upright. It's pure, and it will rejoice our hearts, and we will be in a state of frustration just like Saul when we continually in the light sin against you. Deal with our hearts, Lord. Crush us under your hand, and Lord, destroy all that we are, our opinions, because, God, we, we don't want to displease you. Lord, don't let our lives be as miserable as Saul must have been. All of his presumption. Like David said, Lord, let us be able to see other men and how you've dealt with them. Surely David understood after he saw all the sin of Saul, even, even after he became involved, Lord. And let us be able to see others that we might learn from their mistakes. Let us look at Saul and say, Lord, we know he was your anointed, but let us not be involved in our pride and our arrogance that way. The Lord, to incur your wrath is a, is a terrible thing to fall into your hands. The Lord, we'll praise you and lift you up. You have to give us strength because we're not able. And we glorify you in all things. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.